PC, we're rolling with speed. Okay. Peter, what kind of music did you listen to when you were growing up? Well, when I was growing up, I grew up in the Bronx, New York. And in the Bronx, New York, there was, oh, it was in the 50s, just before the 60s hit. And I think it was just basic rock and roll. I had an uh, older sister who was a dancer. You know, and I think that's what uh, got me really involved in dancing. And um, there was a lot of music, sort of like this real syrupy, Patty Page, you know, Ames Brothers, Mill Brothers that you see on the K-Tel records, you know, and it was all sort of like, um, you know, Frank Sinatra standing on the corner watching all the girls, watching all the girls. And it was all real safe, Eisenhower years, everything was sort of, you know, the beginning of suburbia with the big dream, the American dream was buy, a, you know, buy a house out there and have a, you know, two cars if you're really lucky and, you know, join the country club and life is grand. And sort of, I think the music was expressed in that, except if you turn around the dials, there was a lot of rhythm and blues going on, which was Clovers and Drifters um, and uh, Joe Turner. And I remember hearing, I think it was the first record that really kind of set my soul on fire. It was Little Richard doing Tutti Frutti and Elvis doing Mystery Train, I think it was. And then came Heartbreak Hotel, and that was like, wow, what is all this? And Alan Freed, who was a great disc jockey from... Uh, Cleveland, Ohio, that really coined rock and roll, moved to New York, and he had a show, and he started what was called rock and roll, as far as I knew it, and I was a religious listener. And that's really when I started picking up on people like Bo Diddley, Little Richard, and, of course, later James Brown. How would you, how would you define the term soul music? Well, for me, um, you know, what we call soul music or rhythm and blues. Um, during the 60s or during, I think, 50s or so, you, it was called rhythm and blues, and then it became soul music in the 60s. And I think soul music was a good term then in the sense that it was music that seemed to come out of the church, and it was black music that um, had a real heavy gospel construction to it, and the way it used voices or a choir, it seemed to have a... Right now, oh, can we stop this? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me just do something sorry. here that will like prevent this from... Okay. 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 And tape speed. Okay, let's do that question again. Okay. How would you define soul music? Well, soul music in a definition is it's it's difficult. It's sort of like hey, saying how do you to just say how do you define soul music? Saying how do you define rock and roll? How do you define jazz? You know, it's it's so large uh, um, a form, and there's so many different categories to it. I think for me, basically, what most people call soul music is is a music of Black America that comes out of the church, and it's a music that's very close to the church in the sense that the construction is the same. There's a gospel overtone to it, where the uses of harmonies, the uses of the, the way the lead voice interweaves with the music. And the most important thing is when you hear someone singing within a gospel structure, you know, um, uh, I feel God in my soul, and feel, see a real great preacher singing, or a great gospel choir singing. Um, there's a conviction that what these people are singing, they believe. And when it transpired into popular music, because many of the great soul artists came from the church, came from the gospel church, you feel when you hear someone like a Wilson Pickett singing, you know, I found the love, or James Brown singing, please, 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 you really feel that they are, what they're saying is a valid, truthful statement, and you believe, it's that you don't feel that these guys are just singing this to make a pop hit, that they're just really putting their soul into it. And, then, and that's what attracted me to a lot of the great soul records and the early rock and roll, um, was that there was a, a real conviction from the artist in the music, in the same sense that Dylan later carried on, or the Beatles or the Stones later carried on, that there was a con credibility, where certain artists were just involved in making a real pretty record that was going to sell a lot of copies. Someone like James Brown, there was a real gospel sense where he really felt, 
you know, I lost someone, you know, a million to one, you know, and you just, I lost someone, you know, you say, whoo, this, you know, you get a chill, this guy really, you know, really lost someone. So I'm like, man, I'd like to meet that gal. <laughs> hmm. When you were talking about um, artists and, and soul records, I, I noticed you carried it up, you went Dylan, Beatles, Stones, and kind of stopped there. Is there soul in music today? Are there good soul, new soul artists, do you think? Oh, most definitely, you know, there, there definitely is. I think it's, I think to me, I, you know, it's in the sense of soul in the 60s, that definition, I mean, a lot of those artists are still around. Uh, and as is James Brown, as is Bobby Womack, as is Don Covey, as is Solomon Burke. Um, and I think that there, are, what's interesting about music today is the terrible discrimination that was so prevalent in the 50s and the, what, what they used to call the cover records, where if uh, someone like Joe Turner had Shake, Rattle, and Roll, Bill Haley would copy it, and because he was, you know, white, uh, people would buy that record or uh, most radio stations would play that other than Alan Freed. Um, so that, that was uh, oh, a little action back there. Hmm. <laughs> a little soul in the back. <laughs> but uh, I think, you know, that, that w what's great about it, I think that the conviction I is happening not in just black music, but in, you know, different forms of music. Uh, I think in those days too, a lot of the black artists, some were just involved in making a pop record, but it's the ones that really had a sense of conviction behind their style. You could hear it in the voices, and you can hear it in the records. And that's why, for me, when you hear an old record, an old James Brown record, and you hear, you know, that there was no stereo 24 tracks in a lot of those records. It was just basically things set up, and there was just one or two takes. You hear the power um, of a lot of people like the Five Royals, which is a group that had a great influence on James Brown. And you hear those records, they're, they're magnificent records, they're timeless. I mean, to even redo those songs is ridiculous because there's the sound of those songs make it unique, and the sounds of those records are unique. I was, I was interviewing someone the other day, uh, I was talking to Jerry Wexler, right. and Jerry made a statement, and he said, when it comes to soul music, Pat, I firmly believe that there's Ray Charles and everyone else. Were you a big Ray Charles fan? Did Ray have that sort of impact on you? Oh, most definitely. You know, I, th I think for someone like Jerry Wexler and Ahmed Erdogan, who was on Atlantic Records, I, uh, there was, you know, what they would call the genius of Ray Charles. And Ray Charles really constructed records in a unique way and were influenced a lot of the rhythm and blues performers. And just, there was just something incredibly magnificent. And, you know, his, his influence was so great as Jimi Hendrix's influence on guitar um, to a... Uh, or as Elvis Presley had a great influence. There was a vocal style and just the way he constructed records and some of the songs. And as he progressed, you know, his early, you know, when he started, he sort of copied, you know, Charles Brown and Nat King Cole and developed his own really highly gospel style and really actually brought in gospel choirs, you know, even like a record like Hit the Road Jack, you know. You would almost hear a, a closer gospel sense to Ray Charles than you would to James because James... James brought on a greater pageantry than, uh, uh, and really developed that further than almost any other artist. And I think you still have people today trying to imitate that pageantry, the kind of sort of, seeing a James Brown show is like seeing a great preacher in a cathedral. You know, you, he, turned in, he turned the Boston Garden into a cathedral and it was, James Brown was the great preacher and almost God himself. <laughs> what was the first James Brown show you ever saw? Uh, n New York, the Apollo, 1962, I believe, uh, was my first induction to the uh, throne. Uh, and then there was another show I saw, well, I think it was maybe 64, uh, was at Madison Square Garden, not the new one, but the old Madison Square Garden. And on the show, and I dig this lineup, on the show was um, opening up was this group called, this gospel group called the Soul Sisters. And then came the... Young Rascals. Then came the Shangri-Las. This guy, um, Barry, um, G um, Lightning Strikes. Um, sk skipped out for a second. Okay. I don't, I don't want to uh, make the guy, f uh, Luke Christie. Sorry. Oh, okay. okay. Cut in. <laughs> there was. <laughs> okay, take two. On the show, on the same billing, was the Soul Sisters was a gospel group. There was um, the Shangri-Las. The Young Rascals, Lou Christie, who had this hit, Lightning Strikes, Slim Harpo, 
who had this record out, Scratch My Back. And then came the James Brown Band. Then came the Famous Flames. And then came Bobby Bird. And then out came James. And it was probably the most, I, it was just at the time, I think, maybe Papa had a brand new bag just hit. And it was, you know, the return of James Brown. And the interesting thing about James Brown was that he was to uh, myself and a lot of the musicians, I was going to art school at the time, but James Brown, and for the same time, even the way like Dylan was and certain artists, they didn't really attain um, a great commercial hold until much later on. So when uh, I and friends would get together, we were a real minority James Brown fans. We would collect his records, you know, and sort of like um, all these weird sort of singles that didn't quite uh, make it high on the charts. And we'd search, you know, uh, around different record stores. And I remember the great moment was getting the copy of the James Brown Live at the Apollo Volume 1. And I think that record, if any record changed my life, that was one of them. I must have listened to that record a hundred times to this day. I can do every little bass note. I can do every inflection that the guy did. And I'd listen to it a hundred times. And friends would come over to the house and we'd all go through the whole routine. You know, some cats would be the flames, you know. I, you know, I, I'd get down the microphone and uh, I, mean, I, can, I can hear gals in the audience screaming, and I can tell you exactly what they're screaming. Some of them aren't screaming. <laughs> Some are pretty intense at what they're screaming, if you listen real hard. But it's a great record. It's one of the most exciting live records. And when I was with the Jay Giles band, uh, and we uh, put together our first live album, which was cut in Detroit, Full House, we said if we can capture 100th of the excitement of James Brown Live at the Apollo, we will succeed. Because it, today it's still amazing, amazing record, and I recommend it in every rock and rollers record collection. James Brown at the Apollo, Volume 1. And what year was that? 1962. Amazing. Amazing. Um, would you say, Peter, that uh, James Brown is the man who's had the most influence on your performing career? Well, um, I would say as a performer, definitely he was, um, you know, I think it comes down to uh, as far as performance, Elvis Presley, and then comes James, because they both really knew how to approach a stage, and they both really the, treated the stage as a very sacred area. And they didn't just kind of go out and you know sort of like you know have a you know Coca Cola and say, hey man, you know how you doing tonight? And there was a whole sense of performance. There was a whole religious sense about it. Um, there was a great. Um, happening that, that that went on stage when you went to see a Elvis show or a James show there was uh you know you're going to uh see a spectacular you know something really spectacular James would be spectacular the band would be fantastic the band would be interweaving the dancing the movement and it would just build into this symphonic crescendo that just would just leave you breathless you know at the end of the evening and uh it definitely had a great influence and it was just the way I mean even I mean, certain dancing that, that James Brown invented. I mean, the whole sidestep and the slide back and certain the microphone techniques that you see today in a lot of performance was all invented by James Brown. And, you know, he, you know, there were other artists that were doing great things, like Tommy Hunt, who was with the Flamingos and went out in his own. Joe Tex was like an incredible dancer, but no one really could quite get it all down like James did. It's interesting. I was, I was talking to him yesterday afternoon, James Brown, when I was interviewing him. And uh, it, it seemed like almost every question that I asked him about his, his performance and his musicality, et cetera, et cetera, it all went back to what you were just talking about, the fact that he, it wasn't just a concert, it was a show. And it was, he was so intent on talking about the costumes and the choreography, and he felt that that was one of the things that was really missing from music today, you know, so that so few people have that which is obviously true. Well, yeah, you know, it, it's sort of like when you go to see, there, there was a whole pageantry involved. I mean, it was really an entire evening, like a great theater show. And it was just, you know, uh, entertainment to its highest level. There was, there was the, you know, opening act. There was the MC. Ladies and gentlemen, it's star time. We'd like to bring you right now Man in a bunch of incredible hits as Lost Someone, Million Dollar Seller, Night Train. And, you know, and the band would hit, and it would just... Each, each moment, as soon as you got there, you know, there would be these opening acts, and as the evening progressed, it would just get more excited. Gene Brown will be, the, you know, momentarily, and you know, it would just build until, bang, it was start time, and there he would come out, and he wouldn't just walk out. I mean, he worked. 
he was the hottest working man in show business. This cat came on stage, man, and you just, it was, there was something unbelievable about it. He would do a move, like, wham, and you, you just couldn't believe it. Flick a microphone, you know, and just crawl it back and jump, and it was like, you know, if you blinked, you were afraid you were gonna miss something. It was totally spectacular, totally spectacular. And, you know, just some of the interweaving of music when he got up to periods of, like, um, songs like, um, um, do the camel walk. When it's, there was a time, you know, and he got into, or a man's man's world around 67. Boy, he just started hitting things that no one was really touching upon. A syncopation that today, you know, which later became disco, all came from James Brown. The syncopation that, you know, became disco music in the 70s. And even today, with a lot of the new technical, you know, technical machines like Lindrums and DMXs and all that stuff, it's all music that's based on the syncopation band, James Brown using two drummers and, you know, just being so tight that no other band could play that stuff. It's really nice. I'm, I'm really glad that he has this new hit from Rocky IV because it's putting him out in front of the kids again. Right. You know. Don Hartman is good. Yeah. I love my favorite line from the new record is uh, uh, something about, you know, get co coffee in a hog roll. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite James Brown song? No. No? I like too many of them. It's like, you know, saying, uh, no, no, just could, couldn't even, couldn't even, you know, if I were to pick one and I'd hear another, um, I think, you know, there's, you know, um, Lost Someone, is a of the early ballad styles is a definite, you know, a real beautiful one. I think uh, something like uh, I Feel Good is that mid charter and, you know, that, that sort of mid stage uh, into uh, Baby, Baby, I Got the Feeling. Oh man, there's too many of them. I mean, that's what's so great about it. There's just too many of them. It really is. It's like, you know, saying what's your favorite rock and roll record? I couldn't, couldn't even. Last night when the MC was getting ready to bring him on stage, he was he was just uh, naming off James's hits, and they just went on and on and on and on. It was great. It was the first time I'd ever seen him, so I was really blown away. In the in the uh, in the tradition. A few minutes left now. Okay, you want to change? Let's change. <laughs> 